Glad to see everybody here. We're going to talk about breast cancer. It is kind of a pink month. I see people back there going, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and some space bar. Mm-hmm. I'm going to step away. Okay, that one. Okay, so use, use the arrows then. I think that's right. Okay, so when we start, when Dr. McGuire and I started talking about this, putting this together, the big thing we were asking was what has happened to the breast exam? And because time and time again, we see patients, uh, we see women come in who say, no one has you know, examined their breast. So I have no disclosures, just go for that. It's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So this talk's gonna look at a couple of things. We're gonna look at people who've never had breast cancer. And then we're gonna look at people who have had breast cancer and how do we screen them afterwards? Now, you will notice that neither of us is wearing pink ribbons today. And that's, at least in my case, is deliberate because we know that pink ribbons have raised a lot of awareness and they make us, people go get mammograms. They've really promoted education. But also for women who've had breast cancer, it might actually trigger post-traumatic stress disorder. That some women, when they see that, start thinking about all the challenges they've had as a cancer patient. And we have to remember, we're not celebrating breast cancer we're celebrating advances in breast cancer, that we have fewer women dying of breast cancer and we're having more early detection. Part of this, you'll hear, see a term called cancer land. It's been uh, manufactured by a couple of different authors about people who start feeling victimized by cancer and their whole life is wrapped up in cancer. And we wanna break that. We want people to realize that life goes on beyond cancer. We have a really powerful breast cancer group here at VCU. And so I wanted to tout them at the beginning of the lecture and then at the end of the lecture, because I want you to know that this is available for all women who might, and men who might have a concern about lumps or bumps or breast cancer. We've got a medical oncology team, surgical oncology, radiation, navigators, a survivorship and breast imaging, and realize that we collaborate. So I know some of my surgical colleagues better than I know some of my internal medicine colleagues right now. So you may see these names come around. And here at Massey, we've got a number, and at VCU Health, we have a number of different ways you can find us. You've got breast imaging, which is now Stony Point, AOP, and Greengate, way out west end. Uh, we have a collaborative care clinic where the patient comes, sits there, and in one afternoon or morning, sees all of the doctors who are gonna be involved in her care. One, two, three, four. And so they walk out with a comprehensive care plan, which is really critical for good cancer care. Uh, we have a high-risk clinic, we have a survivorship clinic, and we have a new patient coordinator who'll be glad to get anybody in. Generally, we are getting people in in less than two weeks, sometimes less than a week, depending on uh, whether they want specific doctors um, and depending on what day of the week you call for an appointment. So we're here and we're here to serve patients and we serve uh, quite a lot of them. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. McGuire and then I'll be back at the end. All right, well, thank you all for being here and thank you for having me. Um, so I uh, was tasked with talking about the screening of the uh, asymptomatic patient um, who has never had breast cancer. So I call this feeling the squeeze. Um, and so I do have one disclosure here. Um, so why are we all here? Why are we talking about breast cancer? Why do we have a whole month? Um, and also I'm not wearing pink cause I don't look good in pink. That's why, <laughs> but, um, but so the reason we're looking at breast cancer is because it is one of the most common diseases amongst us women and women nationally, internationally. It's also one of the most common cancer causes of cancer death in, in women, despite all the advances we've made. Um, and so when we look at the trends in cancer death rates, what we see luckily is that over the last several decades, we see a decrease in mortality in breast cancer. Unfortunately, we see a concurrent increase in lung and bronchus cancer because women decided to start smoking. Um, and hopefully we're gonna see that now downtrend, which, is, which looks like it's suggested. Um, but breast cancer uh, mortality has decreased um, in the US. And we think part of that is because of the amazing therapies we have. Um, but a lot of it is because of screening. 
So who's at risk for breast cancer? We talk about this one in eight number. One in eight women will develop breast cancer in their lifetime. Um, when we look at who's going to develop it within the, uh, the next um, several years, we see that women under the age of 50 have a relatively low probability of de developing breast cancer. So they have a 1.9% risk of developing breast cancer in the next year. Um, and so you'll see that these numbers go up as age increases. The probability of dying from breast cancer is also concurrent with the, with, the, with the incidence rates. So the likelihood of dying from breast cancer is pretty darn low for any given person. However, when we look at the distribution of years of life lost due to death from breast cancer, what we'll see is that the women in whom we've been now told don't need screening, the women who um, are ages 40 to 49, actually have some of the highest amounts of years lost due to death from breast cancer. And so this is a particularly vulnerable population, our patients age 40 to 49. And so the question is, why are we talking about not screening these patients? So we're gonna go through a little bit of that. So, um, so again, a little bit more data here. Um, what's really important to know is the reason that we screen is because we wanna catch breast cancer early. We're not preventing it. We're just looking for it so we can catch it early so that women with disease localized to their breast um, will have a 99% survival in five years. Whereas once it gets out to lymph nodes, we're looking at 85% survival and we're looking as at low as 27% five-year survival for women with metastatic breast cancer. So has mammography actually reduced cancer death rate? We all assume it has, but where's the data? So this was a study um, put out by Hendrick et al. And we can see that um, when we look at breast cancer death rates averted over the last three decades, um, what we see is a fairly stable and steady death rate amongst women until mammography was instituted in the US as a standard of care. And then we saw a over 40% decrease in mortality. So certainly that is a good um, you know, sort of uh, evidence that breast cancer does decrease mortality rates. When we look at actually randomized controlled trials, because that's really just a, a just an observational study. Um, when we look at randomized controlled trials, we'll see that women age 40 to 74 who are receiving uh, mammograms have a 20% uh, risk reduction in breast cancer death. Like I said, observational, we're getting up to 40%, but those don't take into account other factors. Um, what's interesting is that observational studies will show benefits in women above the age of 74 receiving mammography, um, as well as that 40 to 74 group. And we'll talk a little bit about when to stop screening in a couple of minutes. One of the biggest trials to establish the benefit of, of screening mammography was the Pan-Canadian study, which was conducted um, in uh, several of the um, districts in Canada um, from 1990 to 2009. They had over 2.8 million women who participated in the study, and they compared cancer death rates in women who had screening versus those who did not with standard mammography. Overall, 40% mortality risk reduction, very similar to what we saw in the last study. Um, and this was statistically significant. What's interesting, again, is we're looking at results by age, and you can see that the greatest mortality risk reduction was in those age 40 to 49, um, very closely followed by those age 60 to 69, and then 50 to 59. And not surprisingly, we see that the mortality risk reduction is the lowest in our, um, in our patients above the age of 70. A Swedish study was also performed, and as many of you guys may know, the Swedish healthcare system is an amazing system to do studies, uh, especially sort of epidemiologic studies because of the, uh, the amazing availability of data within their system. And so they looked at 58 years of follow-up of women receiving screening mammography. Um, and what they found was that those who were screened versus those who were unscreened at 10 years follow-up had a 60% lower risk of dying from breast cancer. And those who, uh, uh, in, in I'm sorry, in 20 years, it was still at 47%. So hinted a little bit about why I believe we should start screening age 40, but let's sort of figure out why that might be looking at data. First of all, breast cancer in young women happens. Um, it's a very serious problem. Over a thousand women under the age of 40 die in the U.S. from breast cancer yearly. Um, when we look at that as compared to the numbers that are experiencing and experience our current pandemic, those are high numbers. Um, you know, this is 80% of women 
um, who are diagnosed in this age group will find their cancers themselves rather than from screening. It's the most common peripartum cancer. Um, and these tumors tend to be more biologically aggressive than those presenting in older patients. And the incidence of metastatic breast cancer is quite high in women um, diagnosed in the age, age group 40, 40 to 49. So just like everything else, everyone has an opinion regarding screening mammography. So we've got multiple groups here, all of whom have their own opinions, none of which agree with each other. So we'll start with the American Cancer Society because it sounds like a good place to start. They talk about cancer. What are their screening guidelines? So this um, goes back to October, 2015. They've since had some updates, but the meat of it is the same, is that they say that for women age 40 to 44 should start annual screening, uh, should have the choice to start annual screening um, and they should be evaluated for a high lifetime risk for breast cancer. 45 to 54, they say yearly mammography, and 55 and older, they're talking about bi-yearly mammography. The U.S. Preventative Task Force, so this was a study that was put out in 09 and updated subsequently in the 2010s somewhere. Um, this was the one that got the most press. Um, this basically said that women under the age of 50 um, on, on the whole don't derive significant benefit as opposed to the risks um, with yearly mammography. Women age 50 to 74 should consider bi-yearly mammography and those above this age 75, they had no idea. They also said that the clinical breast exam um, had no benefit and we will dive deeper into that in a couple of minutes. This is one of the most complicated but most comprehensive. Um, and as, an America, as a member of the American Society of Breast Surgeons, I'm a fan of this one. The reason is, is that it's not, not because it's super complicated, um, but um, it talks about actually engaging your patients in determining their risk for breast cancer as early as age 25. Um, as somebody who sees women come into their office at ages 30, 35, 40, um, who had a familial predisposition to breast cancer that was undiagnosed and unmanaged, who then have locally aggressive breast cancer, some of whom are now metastatic and dying of their breast cancers, um, it kills me that we are not talking about this. So women age 25 and older who have a lifetime risk of breast cancer that's greater than 20% have some screening options. And so we should start talking to our patients about breast cancer screening as early as age 25. Now, those who are at average risk do not need to start at 25. They can start at age 40. And this talks about the benefit of, of tomosynthesis or 3D mammography, which I'll show you guys in a little bit, um, why that would be preferable over standard imaging. So this was a great study put, put out by Eric Manahan um, and, uh, in the Annals of Surgical Oncology, looking at um, different, so basically looking at the American Cancer Society recommendations and then the ASBRS recommendations and how they would improve survival over those of the United States Preventive Task Force recommendations. So down here at the bottom, this is our USPTF recommendation. So every other year, 50 to 74. Here we've got yearly 45 to 54, and then we've got yearly 40 to 84. And what you can see is that while we do see benefit in, um, in reduction of mortality with the UPSTF uh, recommendations, those bump up to 40% if we just screen everybody yearly between ages 40 and 84. Um, that reduction, um, I'm sorry, that increase in life years gained is 72%. That is a big number. Um, and so uh, when we look at the reason we do screening, it's to save lives. Um, and here we are saving lives. All right, so here's the big question when you stop. Um, because 84 sounds quite advanced in age to maybe beginning annual screening mammography. But we do see an increase, uh, um, uh, an increased incidence of breast cancer with age. And we do see a mortality risk reduction um, if women are screened over the age of 74. Really what most people have is a, is a very vague and unsatisfying answer of if, if you and your patient think they're gonna die in the next 10 years, stop screening mammography. As you guys know, you guys have sat in offices with patients and you've had 15 minutes or less to talk to them. So to have the discussion, hey, do you think you're gonna be around in 10 years? Um, it's tough. <laughs> so it's a tough thing, but, but it is true that really that's probably the only age group that doesn't benefit is somebody who is not going, is, it does not expect to be here in 10 years. Um, my grandmother lived to be 104. This means that she should have been getting screened up till age 94. So you think about it that way, um, that's, a, that's a pretty big number. So 
the reason that the USPTF said that we should stop screening women between ages 40 and 49 were because of the risks. So what are these risks? Basically recall and biopsy, the, the risk of a false positive mammogram. Overall recall, meaning coming back for a second mammogram after your first mammogram because they saw an abnormality is pretty uncommon. Only 10% of women will be called back from their, in, from their screening mammogram. And of those, only one to 2% will receive a biopsy. So these false positives and the anxiety surrounding them are commonly presented as the risks. And they were equated one-to-one -one with death from breast cancer in many of these studies. So, you know, we're talking about basically um, the fact that we've got a 40% reduction in mortality um, if we start screening at age 40. Um, Short-term anxiety is real. It happens. And it's, it, it's, I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen to my patients. I've seen it happen to my friends. But it resolves. Um, and women have no long-term anxiety nor adverse health effects when asked several months to years down the road um, about their false positive mammogram. So if mammogram's good, wouldn't ultrasound and MRI be better? Um, so here's an example of an ultrasound. You can see a pretty dense breasted patient here. Um, what you can see is while the mammogram does not really reveal anything, the screening ultrasound does reveal a very small breast cancer. So why don't we ultrasound everybody? Because it's very operator dependent. Um, you cannot take an image of the whole breast all at once. Um, it is expensive. Um, it, it cannot make an, an accurate diagnosis, does not show microcalcifications, which can be a sign of an early breast cancer. Um, and sometimes in a larger breast, you're not gonna be able to see areas deep inside the breast. So it's a pretty expensive intervention that doesn't have a whole lot of benefit over standard mammography. What about MRI? Here we've got another um, dense breasted patient. This is a patient with a BRCA mutation. Um, uh, so, um, so she's being screened at an earlier age than 40. I believe this um, patient was 34 when she was being screened. So you can't see a whole lot with this mammogram, but when you do an MRI, you see her cancer. Um, so again, why don't we do MRIs on everybody? And I'm sure you guys all know why we don't do MRIs on everybody. Um, they're time consuming, they're costly, they require heavy metal dye. Um, lots of patients are claustrophobic. I write a lot of prescriptions for Xanax to get people through MRIs. Um, and the specificity um, is actually quite low while the sensitivity is high. So I've been told it's like a, a tight fishing net in the river. With an MRI, you're going to catch a lot of fish, but you're going to catch a lot of junk too. So when you talk about false positives, MRI is probably the worst of all. So I've said, I made a couple mentions of breast density. Um, and so really that's a description of how much fibrous and glandular tissue is present in the breasts. This can affect not only your risk of breast cancer, but the likelihood that a mammogram is going to detect it. Um, it is not used to gu guide any biopsy decisions, but it certainly does um, oftentimes prompt further workup. So here we're talking about the BIRAD. So you're gonna see, when you see a standard screening mammogram report, you're gonna get two BIRAD scores. You're gonna get a BIRAD for, is there anything bad in this breast? What else do we need to do? And you're gonna get a BIRAD score, um, at least from our imagers, uh, of, of their breast density. And so you can go anywhere from somebody who's pretty much homogeneously dense breasted to somebody who's completely fatty replaced. And you can see how difficult it would be to read a mammogram in a BIRAD score patient. So that's why 3D mammography can often be very helpful. So that's tomosynthesis. And this is something that we can order in the EPIC system um, where 2D mammogram sometimes will hide cancers in a dense breasted patient. The 3D mammography, it's almost like a mini non-contrast CT of the breast. It's gonna take several slices across the breast. Um, and so if you have a mass in the breast, you know, no matter where you, no matter where you image it, you're always gonna hit that mass. And so the computer will account for that and show you that. Whereas if you just have dense breast tissue that's sitting like this, at some point along the arc, you're gonna hit a point where neither of those pieces of density exist and the computer will then show you that. So it can take out, so if you have nothing wrong with your breasts, you're less likely to be called back. And if you have something wrong with your breasts, it's more likely to find it. So 3D mammography is, is, has been a huge, huge advantage, especially for our younger patients. All right, so we're supposed to be talking about the breast exam. So let's go low check for a second. Again, everybody's got an opinion. The, the task force said not recommended. Let's just note that that's a category D recommendation, which is not a very strong recommendation. The only reason they said that is because there's insufficient evidence to look at harm versus benefit. Not that they saw harm, not enough evidence. 
the American Cancer Society says, let's do it every three years for women in their 20 and 30s and then yearly at age 40. And the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology say annual at age 40, every one to, two, one to three years for women 20 to 39 based on their risk. Um, so we've got pretty big group recommending for it and one big group recommending against it. So the thing about a breast exam is you may not on average find a whole lot, but a breast exam, just like anything else, is a skill. And we should be skilled clinicians. And when our patients come in with a problem, we need to be able to diagnose it. Um, and so we don't wanna be sitting down here in the novice range because we don't do a breast exam that often. We wanna be up here in the expert range. So while on the whole, it's maybe not the most diagnostically accurate test, a breast exam, um, it's certainly not gonna be, a, a, accurate um, diagnostic test if you don't do it that often. These are the things our patients are told to feel for. These are the things that they are told to look out for. So how embarrassing would it be as a clinician to come in, to have a patient come in and tell you, well, I think I've got a little bit of dimpling, some inflammation, I've got a vein here. And you go, I don't know, I haven't looked at breast in 20 years, so what are we gonna do about it? You know, we need to be advocates for our patients. We need to be just as good at looking at the breasts as part of a female body um, as they are. Um, and so when I thought about this, the one thing I thought is we do a lot of physical exam things. We listen to hearts. We look at, we listen to lungs. We check for pedal edema. We mash on bellies. Um, so how accurate are other methods of physical exam as compared to our really highly diagnostic imaging uh, modalities that we have these days? So one of the studies I found was lung auscultation. So how many people in this room, when you do a standard physical exam, listen to lungs? Yeah, you guys are medicine people, you're not surgeons, everybody's listening, all right? Um, so, so when we look at the diagnostic accuracy of lung auscultation, um, sort of all over, the sensitivity is pretty low. So for any, um, for any diagnosis here in this study, it was less than 40% diagnostic accuracy. Specificity was higher at 0.89, but when you look at the area under the curve for all comers, um, we're, at, we're sitting at 70%, which is not a very good area under the curve. So basically what that says is that basically an area under the curve of 0.5 means that your diagnostic test is just as good at flipping a coin. So 0.69 is not much better than 0.5. Um, so it's not the most fabulous diagnostic test, but we all do it every single time we see a patient. So why are we not doing breast exams? All right, I'm gonna quickly talk about breast cancer at a higher risk, and then I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Hackney to talk about survivors. Who's at high risk? lots of things can predispose a patient to high risk. There are some really good calculators out there that can help you define it. Or if you, if you sense that a patient's at high risk, just send them to the high risk program, we'll figure it out. Most breast cancer is sporadic. It's not going to be familial. Um, it's not gonna be hereditary, but there are some patients who have a hereditary risk for breast cancer and we need to identify them early and screen them appropriately. Like I said, that would be consisting of mammogram and MRI starting as early as age 25, alternated, um, so that they're getting those, those tests yearly. So that would be women with genetic mutations, women with strong family histories, women who've had chest radiation, um, so sort of mantle radiation, um, which is less and less common these days, but we still see them every now and again, um, and women who've had biopsies that show atypia in their breast. So just in brief summary, um, screening mammography reduces mortality for breast cancer. There are various recommendations as to when to start and when to stop. We do have some helpful adjuncts, including clinical breast exam, and women at elevated risk, risk for breast cancer should be followed closely, whether within a clinic or within our own offices. Um, and we have some really good recommendations as to how best to do that. So thank you guys for listening to me uh, pramble on here for a little while. And I'm gonna leave some time for Dr. Hackney to talk about her topic. Thank you. We're all on the speakers. So Again, we're going back to what has happened to the breast exam. And, you know, as, can, as Dr. McGuire mentioned, you know, we're seeing a decrease in uh, cancer death. We're seeing a little bit of decrease in incidence, probably because we've taken away hormone replacement. We see death rate continuing to decline. We're catching cancer earlier and earlier. But what that also leads us to, uh, and just another point about how many deaths we see, we have 287,000 women diagnosed a year with breast cancer, but we only have 43,000 a year die of breast cancer. That's a huge difference. 
which means there's a huge number of breast cancer survivors, somewhere between the neighborhood of 2.5, 2.8 million breast cancer survivors these days. Now, who is taking care of those patients? And so that's what a little bit of my focus is gonna be on today is about how do we take care of that survivor? That's what we call tertiary screening. Uh, and what do we need to do for them? Again, just emphasizing survivorship. Uh, with all cancers, we are seeing increased survivorship. Uh, and so they're expecting what, 26 million by 2040? And if you notice, it's all age groups. So again, more and more survivorship. The standard rule from the American Cancer Society is one out of two men will have cancer during their lifetime. One out of three women will have cancer during their lifetime. Not necessarily dying of it, but just having that. So who's gonna take care of the cancer survivors? One of the challenges we're having is that in oncology clinics, we're overwhelmed with all these survivors. And as a breast cancer physician, I am, and I've been here a few years, as y'all heard, um, there are a, somebody described me as an institution the other day. I wasn't sure if I liked that one or not. Um, there are tons of patients who are surviving breast cancer. And what do we do with these patients and how do we manage their long-term care? We also know that primary care is in short supply. Well, as it came out recently that what B, uh, Richmond is down by what, 25% of their primary care physicians. I think something like that. I saw some number about that. So we know primary care is in short supply. So how do we have medical oncologists get their patients from us to the primary care physician uh, for long-term care? And so we want to talk a little bit about some of those pieces. Um, it used to be, I just saw a bit of big history, is everybody used to have these little shower cards hanging in their uh, showers about how to do your own exams. So some of you may have seen these or not. We don't uh, uh, see them anymore. They've sort of disappeared. And there's somebody was protesting about don't take away my breast exams. I'm not quite sure if that came from a mammography or actually physical exam. But when we look at cancer survivors, one of the things we want to, who can do the best care for a cancer survivor? And there are multiple models out there for cancer care delivery in the survivorship mode. Uh, you can have in-clinic care with an oncologist who stays with you for the long term. But, you know, at some point, uh, patients always want to be with their oncologist. They think they will pick things up faster but we may not be paying as much attention to the other parts of healthcare because the patient may pay more attention to their oncologist than to their primary provider. Uh, a lot of places use nurse practitioners or physician's assistants to do cancer care. So the physician finishes their part and they move the cancer care over to uh, an APP of some type to do the ongoing care. We see that a lot in our surgical oncology clinics and we're trying to do more of that in our medical oncology clinics as well, is that you don't have to have the physician's expertise in some of the long-term care. Uh, works well when you've got a large multifaceted practice, but if you're a general oncologist in the community, you don't always have that uh, bandwidth. Uh, some places have a very specific survivorship clinic, and we've been fortunate to have that developing here, but, uh, Again, you have only a few providers and you have this increasing number of survivors, how you get all of them through the survivorship clinic and how, do, how does the survivorship clinic interact with primary care? Where does one stop and one end? Um, I think when we talk about shared care and communication between oncologists and primary care, that has actually been one of the big bonuses is electronic medical records. And I will dare I say, a bonus of EPIC, because so many primary care doctors in our community use EPIC, uh, then we're able to better communicate with, with them as to what's going on with their patients. So the more electronic medical records can easily share, the more that we can share care successfully and in a timely manner. And uh, so, and then when you talk about like the specialty clinic we had earlier, where we all see a patient one time to give them a new diagnosis plan. We don't wanna be doing that every six months. We don't have the time, neither is it a great use of time. Uh, if you wanna look at what the guidelines are for survivorship care, whether it be breast cancer, lung cancer, colorectal, 
the two places I suggest are cancer.net and nccn.org. They have very specific guidelines, evidence-based about how care should happen uh, for long-term after somebody has completed their treatment for lung cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, lymphoma, a number of other cancers. So it's always a good, easy access. And for breast cancer, which is why we're here today, we're talking about peak, it's recommended that for the first couple of years that they see an oncology-based practitioner every three months for the first two years, then years three through five every six months. And then when you get to the five-year mark, if they're not continuing on hormonal therapy or on ongoing care of uh, anti-cancer care, that patient can be released back to their primary care physician for long-term management. Uh, sometimes that is a challenge. Sometimes patients don't wanna leave. Sometimes uh, primary care doctors are reluctant to take on oncology patients because they're afraid they're gonna miss something. Also, primary care doctors are, as we all know, incredibly busy. But, um, you know, it's there and it's possible. And the key is us making it happen. When you think about what do you need to do for a breast cancer patient, it's a basic physical exam and breast imaging if they still have bosoms, okay? There's no magic lab work. There's no magic tumor markers. Uh, there's no routine CT scans, bone scans, anything like that. It's an exam and breast imaging if appropriate. So it's a pretty straightforward approach to how to take care of, of a patient. I am COVID negative. I've been checked. I'm just getting over a cold. Um, there is, uh, to Dr. McGuire's point, we do not use routine MRI scanning. Uh, it is only for people with high risk uh, breast imaging or strong family history. Uh, so it's basically uh, mammograms as we need to. Uh, there's no routine test. Patients always want a blood test. Uh, there are a couple companies looking at trying to find a blood test to early detect cancer, looking for circulating DNA, circulating tumor cells. It's not ready for prime time in the breast cancer world, uh, but uh, certainly hopefully that will be something that might give people some reassurance that their cancer is not active. Um, and I think you know one of the key things and those websites I gave you earlier, I direct patients to look at that. The cancer.net has a whole section on when to call your physician, losing weight without trying, new lumps or bumps, shortness of breath, feeling like you're pregnant and you know you're not, your belly's full of fluid. Uh, those are things that say, raise a hand to the oncologist. And a primary care can see that, the patient can see that. And I try to reassure them uh, that these are things that we need to incorporate in care. One of the other things is genetic counseling. Now we are increasingly looking at genetic counseling. There are more genes than just BRCA1 and 2. PAL-B2 is one that's both breast and pancreatic. So if somebody, if you start to hear family history, oh, somebody came in and saw me the other day who was a six, seven year survivor, but they've got two more family members diagnosed with breast cancer. Okay, let's get you back into genetics. Let's retalk about genetics. So keep an ear open about what's happening in the family in terms of new cancers being diagnosed, maybe they need to go back and look and get what we call a broad panel of genes so that we are looking at, uh, checking my time so we have some questions, a broad panel of genes, that's really critical. Now, Dr. McGuire mentioned the breast exam, that is key. Uh, and if you have forgotten how to do it, the Stanford Medicine, I found this on the web the other day, has a great video and great descriptions on how to do breast exams. Three fingers, pads, circles in some pattern. And these are the three main patterns, either circles, pie wedges, or I call them lawnmower lines up and down. It, you do it one time thoroughly on each breast, starting from the axilla going forward or either way, be consistent. You'll get very good at it. All breasts are lumpy bumpy. It's a given, but these are the three main techniques. And if you need a nice little refresher, go take a look at this uh, website. Uh, the signs and symptoms of breast cancer. Again, it was mentioned a little bit earlier, changes in the nipple, retraction, uh, scaliness around the nipple, it could be Paget's disease, blood dripping out of the nipple, we worry about 
brown, not so much. Clear, white, send them to endocrine, okay? So clear and white, we, tend, we don't worry about malignancy. Something that's red that looks like cellulitis, uh, if you treat them with antibiotics for a week and it doesn't go away, send them to us. So that becomes a concern about inflammatory. You may not even feel a mass. So signs and symptoms. Now, this lady had breast cancer. She had a lumpectomy and radiation therapy, okay? So she's coming in for her exam. And uh, everybody knows which side's got the breast cancer, right? Any guess? Left side, correct. Her left, that side, breast cancer. So breast exam after a segmental mastectomy. Your patient had part of her breast removed. First tip for that, shirt off, bra off. You cannot do a good breast exam with garments over the breast, okay? If you're a male, a chaperone. Okay, I forgot to put that on here, but I should say that. Uh, you want to examine supraclavicular nodes, feel the grooves. Okay, you want to look at the skin over the breast. You want to look for redness. You want to look for dimpling, for scaling. Um, you want to do a breast exam like we described earlier. You want to feel the axilla for lumps and bumps. Okay, these are all areas. Now, you may notice some changes in the breast due to around the surgical scar, maybe thicker, maybe tender. Uh, from the radiation and changes. Don't be alarmed by that, but you will know what it feels like on a regular basis. The radiated breast may be a little smaller, may shrink, uh, may be a little tighter, and the other breast may be doing whatever God intended in drooping. So you will see a little bit of difference here, but that's okay. That is the way it's supposed to be. Uh, occasionally, you may see a little bit of edema. That's how you do a breast exam after a segmental mastectomy. The mammograms are yearly. You do a 3D if available. You do not need diagnostic. You want a screening mammogram. And you use your MRIs limitedly. Ultrasound, as Dr. McGuire talked early, is also limited. Uh, it's not paid for as a screening tool in Virginia. So you do have to look, uh, think carefully about when you use it. Uh, let's say somebody has a unilateral or bilateral mastectomy. They have a scar without a rebuilding. So you examine the chest wall without a shirt, without undergarments again, uh, close off. Okay, look for skin changes. Recurrences in the skin often look like hard red rubber erasers. Okay, so I tell people to look for something that looks like, not sort of mushy like a pimple, but sort of firm like a hard red rubber eraser. And it's oftentimes red and raised. You see something like that across the chest wall, raise a hand, get them back to their surgeon or their medical oncologist. Again, check supraclavicular nodes, check axillary nodes. The only thing you're going to mammogram is a native breast. Okay, so this is a lady who's had a mastectomy with an implant reconstruction, okay? So what are we going to do with this lady, okay? So we're going to evaluate over the implant. We're going to do that skin check. Okay, we're going to look for those hard little red rubbery things. Hopefully we don't find anything. Uh, we're going to see what the implant looks like. If it is distorted, if it is thickened, then we're going to send her back to her plastic surgeon. She may need to have some evaluation done. If, uh, if it's red, then again, she may need to see her surgeon. You're going to do lymph nodes. You're going to do axilla. You do not mammogram an implant. You do not put that under the press. Okay. The native breast can get, like in this case for this lady, the left breast will get a mammogram. We will not touch this with any form of breast imaging, okay? Now, there are some people who think that uh, we need to implant, to do an MRI of those implant, oops, implants periodically. Uh, there's a little bit of controversy about that. It's purely looking for whether the implant's intact or not. It has nothing to do with looking for cancer. If there's any breast tissue, it's out here where you can feel it with your hands, okay? There's no breast tissue behind the implant. So one of the funny things we'll see sometimes if somebody gets pregnant, then sometimes there'll be little tender spots over the implant, which is where there might be a little bit of residual breast tissue. Remember, a mastectomy takes off 95% of the breast. So it's very rare that you're gonna see anything significant for uh, breast tissue. Uh, with flap reconstruction, um, I did not find a picture I liked on that one. The mound may be numb. 
It may feel like a breast, but recognize that it's tissue off of the belly or off of the back if it's a latissimus flap. Uh, occasionally, you'll find some little rocky hard um, lumps around the scar. That's called fat necrosis. You use an ultrasound to confirm that. But the one thing that you don't do is you do not mammogram reconstructions that are flaps. We still have a mam we still have a couple people in our area, including one at VCU, who likes to mammogram flaps. There's not breast tissue. If a flap reconstruction is off your belly, so you're basically doing a mammogram of belly fat, doesn't make any sense. So we don't mammogram flaps. If there is a concern about what's going on, then ultrasound, other types of imaging uh, work better. So again, no significant breast tissue remaining. A couple of things just uh, for bits and pieces <coughs> in taking care of survivors. So those are the breast exams after you've had cancer. Pretty straightforward. They can be done by a primary care doctor. My fingers aren't any better than yours, except I do it all the time. Uh, and so, you know, patients who are 10 years out can certainly be seen by primary care doctors. Um, uh, Post-surgical bras, mastectomy bras, prosthesis can be written by anybody. You get three to six bras a year. There are lots of nipple opportunities everywhere from tattoos to rub-ons. If somebody like the lady who had an implant didn't have a nipple done yet, you can do rub-ons, you can do uh, tattoos. So there are a lot of, you can do glue-ons now too. So there are a lot of opportunities to help a woman feel well uh, as she is a cancer survivor. So what we, you know, what I want to say is that you know, if you care for a woman who's more than 10 years out, then that real care can go back to primary care. Because at that point, I'm more worried about their cholesterol, their blood sugar, all the other health things. And cancer is not likely to be their cause of death. Um, and all of our clinics are booming. I'm in the process of trying to discharge a bunch of people and get them back to primary care. If I can keep all the primary care doctors from retiring in the community, I'd be happy. Um, but the addition of a clinical exam is pretty straightforward. The risk of somebody getting cancer in the opposite breast, if you've had it on one side, is about 1% per year. So it's not very high. You're going to do your imaging. Um, and so, you know, I say let's work collaboratively on caring for this increase in number of 2.8 million breast cancer survivors. Uh, and we need to do more collaborative care. We do collaborative treatment at the beginning. We need to do collaborative long-term care. Again, one of the best websites I like is thecancer.net. And we're gonna, we have maybe two minutes for questions or so here. Um, so that's a, a war food. And I think you're governing questions. Anything in the audience while y'all are sitting? Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. No, they, the only thing you need to do a breast exam with is a pair of hands, okay? You don't even need equipment other than your hands, okay? It's pretty straightforward, so. So statistically, yeah. So yeah. So the question is for um, for those who are receiving screening mammography um, at ages forty and greater, what's the added added benefit of a clinical breast exam? So um, there are a couple of articles that address this. Um, we don't see uh, a statistically significant increase in detection, but there is a clinically significant increase in detection. Um, it, most of the benefit is going to be in those who are not receiving yearly mammography, especially our younger patients. Um, but again, it's not, it's not necessarily that you're going to detect that cancer on that breast exam. It's that when the patient comes in with a complaint about a lump or a bump that you've actually felt what a breast cancer feels like, and you felt what normal things feel like, and you can make that clinical distinction. Um, one thing I did want to mention while I got the podium here is, mm -hmm. um, just cause somebody has a nipple doesn't mean they didn't have a mastectomy. We do a lot of nipple sparing mastectomies. Yeah. So don't yeah. assume that just cause they have a nipple that, that needs a mammogram. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So, and just to another point, there used to be a line on mammograms that said mammograms miss about 10% of cancers. Mm -hmm. So that sort of still holds, I think with 3D, you may be a little bit more sensitive, 
So recognize if somebody says, I had a mammogram and they come in and they say, well, I feel a lump. You know, things have, mammograms a picture in time. It is not predictive. It just tells us what we look like that day. So we do have to listen to our patients if they come in and say, okay, I have a lump, but I had my mammogram five years ago. Don't blow it off. Come in and do an exam and see what's going on. Yes, ma'am. So the question is about uh, who gets 3D mammograms and who gets uh, breast MRIs. Um, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, so 3D mammography um, is not covered by all insurances. So a lot of it is up to the patient. The patient is actually asked when they show up for their screening mammogram whether they'd like a 3D mammogram. Now, if you have a patient who's been identified as having dense breasts or a patient who is at increased risk or a patient you're screening early for whatever reason, um, then you can order within Epic, you can order specifically a 3D mammogram. And so you can make that call. Um, but oftentimes it's, you know, the radiologist saying, hey, I think you'd benefit from a 3D mammogram. Um, do you want to do it? Um, most, most insurances are covering it these days, but not all. Um, in terms of the MRI, it's women who are at a greater than 20% risk of uh, lifetime risk of breast cancer. Um, so that can be determined by any familial risk model. Um, the tyracusic is probably the most common um, and it's something that's available online. Um, so it's a little bit hard to do like in a busy primary care clinic to figure that out. So that's why, you know, if you think you've got somebody who might qualify, we're always happy to see them in high risk. Um, if they have a greater than 20% lifetime risk documented, the MRI will be covered by insurance. Yeah, yeah, Mark, Dr. DeWitt. Right now, uh, for men, unless there is a known BRCA gene, there's no recommendation for routine mammography. Believe it or not, you can do mammography in men. So we see only about nationally about 2,000 cases of male breast cancer a year. Uh, the biggest thing we look at is you're seeing a lot of, uh, if they have a strong family history of breast cancer, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer in the family, then screening for BRCA might make good sense on that. If it's both, if it's uh, bilateral gynecomastia, it's simply an exam, not a mammogram. So that would be the standard for gentlemen right now. So yeah, and, and if you think about it, I mean, we're doing mammograms to decrease mortality. Uh, the mortality risk of somebody with cirrhosis is from their cirrhosis, not from their gynecomastia. Yeah. yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so the question is about uh, transitioning. Do they do uh, breast imaging in people? So male to female, um, we have, they have not standardly said mammogram yet. Uh, certainly an exam is important. Uh, female to male actually puts you at increased risk for estrogen negative breast cancer because you're doing a higher androgen uh, load. Uh, but again, if you're doing a female to male, uh, unless somebody has had mastectomies, they're going to need to have uh, ro robust screening in terms of exam and breast imaging. So it's an evolution. It's TBD, yeah. but certainly when in doubt, yeah. I, I, we have um, we have a great program called Every Woman's Life that covers uh, mammograms for women who are uninsured or, or low income. Um, and I just learned yesterday that that includes transgender women. So, yeah. Question in the chat if you can tell folks a little more about your high risk clinics, like how to make the referral and you know who we should be sending you away. Um, I think those, you actually had a slide on that that slides to your using the presentation. Ooh, yeah. uh, all the way back to Candace here. <laughs> no, I think it's actually so I think it's your slides. Um, but so yeah, so the high risk clinic is run through um, is run through breast imaging and surgical oncology. Um, so that um, that referral can either go through the EPIC system where there is a referral to high-risk breast, 
or you can call our um, our intake specialist. I think you have that number in like slide three. Yeah, um, yeah I should yeah. have. I just got crazy there, so that's yeah. okay. Okay, let's see. Where? I think it's like like original. Oh wait, so it was original. It was yeah. original three. That's right. Yeah. I apologize. Um, but so yeah, you can way. just call our our new new intake coordinators, and they will get the patient um schedule. There we go. Yeah, that eight two eight nine four four, four seven. seven. Yeah, and actually, you can actually get to it through the breast imaging as well if you mm -hmm. need to refer somebody because the clinic is um at Stony Point. We have breast imaging and breast surgical oncology and high risk kind of um, buried to each other. They're right next door. So um, either way, but the 8289447 is new patient coordinator for oncology services. And we'll get you to the breast team uh, into our navigator into the high risk clinic. Same thing goes for survivorship clinic. Survivorship is actually a ambulatory referral in Epic like you would anybody else. You'll go, if you say survivorship in your referral, pattern, it'll say um, uh, survive, cancer survivorship clinic, and you can refer somebody to that. It does not have to be breast. It can be somebody else who's a long-term survivor. Uh, I just sent somebody there who is a long-term Hodgkin's uh, survivor who needs some uh, intense monitoring. So uh, you might sit, find some others. So. One question in the chat but, uh, for the person the question, you can choose if you want to uh, respond. Uh, Take it offline, otherwise, uh, what happened to mm -hmm. you soon? Mm -hmm. soon disappeared. Uh, I don't, you guys can choose if you uh, want to address it. Um, I think you said before that people have had flat. So, so, so there was, so this is a question about the mammography on flaps. Uh, and there was um, some imagers who, felt that that was the right thing to do. And there was a period of time where people were doing uh, mammography on flaps, whether a tram flap or deep flap, the abdominal muscle. Uh, as we have looked at the literature more and more, and as we've talked as a breast cancer collaborative group, uh, we have felt that there's no real indication to be doing mammograms. Uh, and so we have been trying to uh, discourage uh, doing mammograms I mean, again, as I said, you're doing a mammogram on breast tissue, the minimal amount of, uh, sorry, a mammogram on abdominal tissue, mm -hmm. the minimal amount of breast tissue, you could got fingers, hands yeah. on the outer edges. So, um, and so it's, again, an evolution of standard of thought here. So it was not wrong that you were getting, if somebody was getting a mammogram, but it's just where the, where the information is now. So I think the the one that's probably most realistic for you all to follow are the um are the American Cancer Society guidelines where I mean you pretty much start at age forty um and yeah. and and go from there I think it was like forty to seventy four. Um, I think asking people to do that in-depth analysis from age 25 is going to be really difficult, um, but it's certainly to be aware that if you start hearing lots of cancer in a family or a patient who's had weird biopsies, just get them to the high-risk clinic. We'll take care of it from there. Um, but I think just starting at age 40 and going yearly thereafter, I, I mean, I will tell you as a woman and as a surgeon, um, I would take many numbers of, of, of recall biopsies before I would like to die of breast cancer. So equating them one-to-one -one is an invalid study. <laughs> yeah, and when I stop is, I mean, she said 74, you sort of look, if somebody's got a good chance of living another 10 years, if you found something on mammography and they would do something about it, they would get a biopsy, they would get surgery and they're well enough to get those things, then I might continue into their early eighties. You know, if I have, you know, a couple yeah. of ladies who are, you know, playing golf, you know, they're playing 18 holes three times a week and they're 85 years old. Yeah, I might do a mammogram on them. They're well enough to get it if I think it might be the influence on their quality of life future. So yeah, it becomes a very individualized discussion at that point. Yeah, you can use the pickleball rule. They play pickleball, they should have a mammogram. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, thank you guys so much. You're welcome. Thank, thank you for having us. Thank you everyone for joining, appreciate it.